to be live now, am I? Yeah. Hi, my name's Gareth Locke from The Human Diver. I've been running these human factors or non-technical skills programs since January 2016. They're a mixture of online and face-to-face -face programs with the aim of improving the performance and safety of the divers that are out there. It's aimed at any diver, but really those who take greater risks. Instructors, cave divers, rebreather divers, technical divers, because we need to understand how we make the failures that we do and what we can do to prevent those or predict them and go from that. Human factor for me is, uh, is uh, food for instructors and brain training. For me, the human factors in diving course is all about personal development and working in a team. So what I will change is uh, have more. All right, I don't know. It seems like it froze up. So I do apologize for that, uh, Gareth. That's uh, okay. All right. Well, anyways, we got some early birds uh, that have already joined us. Uh, I can see scuba diving uh, Nemo. Welcome. Nice to have you on board. Sean Smith, uh, what does he say there? Uh, let me pop his uh, very much forward to the presentation. Thank you for hosting it. Only a pleasure. And uh, I hope you can enjoy it. Um, well, I suppose we just hang tight for a little bit as we wait for more people to join. Uh, but we'll give it another maybe two or three minutes, and then I think we can kick start it, eh, Gareth? Um, yeah, no, that works for me. And, and I would just ask, you know, before I uh, do my introductions and things like that, um, you can see me and hear me. I can't see you. I can see your responses that come back in. But if you've got any questions, please ask in the comments bit, because one of the bits that I'll, I'll talk about as we go through um, is that, that human factors is, is general in nature and specific in application. And that means that, you know, there's some really detailed theory that's out there and then people go, well, how do I use it? Um, and I'm much better at ask, answering problems or questions that say, look, I've got this scenario, how would you deal with it? Because there are a million permutations of, of stuff that I could put out there and it might not apply to you. So if you've got any questions and you've got any things that you want to say, please put them in the chat. And if you're watching this on record, please put them in the chat as well because I'll follow them or tag me and I'll follow up on the answers after the session as well. So that's great. All right. Well, great stuff. So, um, yeah, I can see we've got a couple more folks. Uh, 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 Yuck from um, Alpha Dive. He's uh, based uh, in a place called Strand, just uh, off Cape Town, uh, from a dive center called Alpha Dive. So great to have you on board. We've got Linda. Uh, thanks uh, for, you, uh, for the use of uh, all the things, all the way from uh, the Netherlands. Jeremy. Uh, Yan and so many more. So yeah, great to, to see the folks uh, join in. So I think what I'll do is maybe just get the uh, formalities behind us, um, introduce myself and, and uh, you as well. I think many people know you, some might not. So let's uh, let me just grab some goodies here. All right. So uh, for the folks that don't know me, my name is Mornay Christo and I'll be your host this evening. And I'm from Divers Alert Network, Southern Africa. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining the webinar. I know that your time's valuable, uh, so I hope you're going to enjoy it this evening. And I hope that you'll also find it very informative. So um, uh, I trust that everybody's doing well and that you're health and, uh, or safe and healthy wherever you are in the world. Now, the talk topic this evening is the human factors in diving. Uh, a couple of basic housekeeping rules, as Gareth said earlier. Your video is turned off as well as your mic, so uh, please make use of the chat or comments box to introduce yourself and tell us where you are in the world, and also let us know what you're expecting from the webinar. So uh, during the presentation, um, if you have any um, questions, uh, you're welcome to post those in the uh, chat or comments box, but please use hashtag ask and then place your question after that. That just helps me uh, identify the question amongst all the uh, the comments, so that'll be helpful. And for those folks that uh, either weren't able to attend this evening 
or if you're from South Africa and you're hit by load shedding, the replay of the, the webinar will be available by the Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel. So, uh, yeah, keep a lookout for that in the uh, follow-up email tomorrow. Then from my side, I have to say thank you for supporting Divers Alert Network. It's the world's most recognized and respected uh, dive safety organization. Now, if you're not a Dan member yet, uh, why not join today? And you can visit any of our websites within the Southern Africa region. It's danesa.org. If you're from the States, it's dan.org. And if you're from the European region, it's daneurope.org. Now, if you're already a Dan member, thank you for your ongoing support. Now, to help us uh, continue offering great content via YouTube channel, um, it'll be great if you feel like supporting the channel by donating via the Super Chat function via the YouTube uh, feature. And uh, now over to our main uh, uh, event of the evening, and that's obviously the talk by Gareth. And I'd just like to introduce him. For those that don't know him or possibly didn't read up in some of the mails and things that went out or the registration form, here goes. So Gareth Locke has been involved in high-risk work since he left school in 1989. And he has spent 25 years in the Royal Air Force in a variety of frontline operational research and development and system engineering roles, which has given him a unique uh, perspective. Now, in 2005, he started his dive training at GUI and is now an advanced Trimex diver and JJ CCR uh, Nomoxic Trimex diver. And in 2016, uh, he formed the Human Diver with the goal of bringing his operational human factors and system thinking to diving safety. Now, since then, he's trained more than 350 people face-to-face -face around the globe, taught nearly 2,000 people uh, via online programs, and sold more than 4,000 copies of his uh, book, Under Pressure, Diving Deeper with Human Factors, and also produced, if only, a documentary about a fatal dive told through the lens of uh, human factors and a just culture. Um, his goal is uh, bringing human factors, practice, and knowledge into uh, the diving community to improve safety, performance, and enjoyment. Now, just a quick recap of the uh, talk topic, which is human factors in diving. Uh, this is uh, the first of a series of webinars, which uh, Gareth will look at uh, what uh, human factors is and what it isn't, and uh, why it's important for divers, instructors, dive center managers, and training agencies and how to apply some simple ideas to improve diving safety and uh, diving enjoyment. So that's uh, jam-packed. I'm looking forward to it from my side. Over to you, Gareth, and I hope everybody will enjoy the uh, the webinar. Excellent. Thanks so much for the uh, the introduction. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge topic. And as I said to Monet, this is just going to be the first one. And I, I really appreciate the, the ability, the opportunity to talk to the audience that's out here. Um, I'm strong supporters of, uh, of, of Dan, the working with Dan America and or Dan in America and Dan Europe, uh, and now with, uh, with Dan Southern Africa. And it's, it's a, as I say, it's a huge area and I'm only gonna really scratch or touch the top of it to, to today. And then over the next months, we'll, we'll cover some of the subjects in a little bit more detail. Um, so without uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and okay. go through that. Now, when I share my screen, the, the chat window will disappear, which is a bit of a pain, uh, which means yeah. that, Mornay, I'm going to need you to basically tell me if there's something, a question that needs to be said there. I'm happy to answer as we go along. Um, but yeah. uh, we'll go from there. All Excellent. Right. So, uh, let me get that up and running for you. Perfect. Excellent. Right. So you should have the introduction slide. Is that right, Moni? Correct. Yes. Uh, human factors and non-technical skills in diving. Cool. Right. So um, Moni's covered uh, a number of those bits uh, already in my uh, introduction. The other bit that uh, isn't captured in there is my my role. I've done all my training through GUE. Well. I've done an advanced nitrox and deco and an initial JJ course through TDI. But pretty much everything has been done through GUE. A number of years ago, I was put into the role of director for risk management and trying to bring some of the, the human factors and risk management aspects into the agency. And I saw just before I uh, shared the screen, there was a comment about not being in training materials or training agency materials. And that is 
a, a huge goal of mine is to actually get this material flowed through the instructor development, the instructor training programs into the instructor programs and then into uh, the student level materials. Uh, and it has to flow down that way um, because you can't have the instructors teaching stuff if the instructor trainers don't know what's going on. So I've managed to, because of my role within GUE and because they recognize the value of this, we've managed to put human factors into the two rebreather classes and the hypoxic trimix class and looking at how do we put them into other materials. So there are opportunities to do that. It requires the leadership to recognize the value. And one of the hardest bits about human factors, and I, I sort of touched on it in the introduction piece, is that it's, it's a really huge topic and people don't necessarily understand what it's about. And it can often be summarized as, this is just common sense. And it's not, because common sense is not common. Um, it is in hindsight, and we can see where things had gone wrong, and we can easily identify the issues, but that's not necessarily the, the case in real time. Now, I wrote under pressure as a way of codifying, documenting all of this stuff, um, and I've had a lot of positive feedback from divers and also non-divers. It brings the same sort of stuff that I took from aviation and oil and gas and um, uh, healthcare and, and repackaged it into diving. And the irony is now people in other high risk industries are now taking my material and using it in their own. It's like, fine, I don't care. You know, I, I stand on the shoulder of giants that are out there. Um, so I wrote Under Pressure and then the documentary, which I'll touch on right at the end, if only I would highly recommend, if you haven't seen it, go and watch it because it brings together the whole range of what human factors and non-technical skills are about in the diving environment in a very emotional, powerfully emotional story where we talk to uh, the widow of the diver who died plus the dive team that was involved. So ultimately, you know, nobody goes to work to do a bad job. Um, and, and I would say the same thing happens in the diving environment. Nobody goes out on a dive um, with, with the intention of getting bent um, with the intention of breaking their equipment, with the intention of losing their buddy or their student or getting decompression sickness or ultimately dying. Everybody's trying to do their best. And in other high risk industries, there are examples of this in aviation. Um, in 1977, two 747s collided on a runway in Tenerife and 583 people killed. Um, and you sit there and go, there was technically nothing wrong with those aircraft. But there was a series of confusions, miscommunications, misunderstandings, a lack of awareness about where aircraft were that led to this. And it was one of the seminal events in aviation. Bottom left uh, is a story called The Nightmare Before Christmas, in which a, a surgeon was operating on a patient. Um, and unfortunately, the uh, blood vessel burst. There was lots of blood in the, the body cavities. And they were using lots of these surgical sponges to soak up the blood. Um, and what they're supposed to do is count them out, um, count them in and then count them out at the end of the operation to make sure that nothing's been left behind. And unfortunately, one of the sponges was left behind. It's a, a never event. It shouldn't happen. Um, and the, the, the doctor was held up in you know, a disciplinary action against them. And they said, look, I could either stop the patient bleeding and then dying or I could spend time counting these things there is no way of managing everything so well given the pressures that we're on. Um, so, you know, doctors, highly professional individuals make mistakes. Top right was a team Great Britain in the women's relay race, four years of training, and the rider at the back is the oncoming relay race, uh, relay rider, which means that they're crossing the line before the offgoing rider is. And that means that team got disqualified. They won all of their stuff up to the final and they were expected to win the gold. And all it took was 35 centimeters to be disqualified from the gold. Four years gone because of a foot and a bit. And then in bottom right, I'm going to show a little video of the difference between what's good and what doesn't necessarily happen so well. So this is a really well-trained, high-performance team. And this isn't the fastest 
pit change that happens is down to now, I think, 1.83 seconds to do a four-wheel change on a Formula One car as they come into the pit. But it doesn't always go so well. This is a team who'd come in, made a, uh, a tactical decision to come in and refuel, and they didn't actually need to do so, but they, they hedged their bets. And unfortunately, the stress meant that the guy who was controlling the lollipop to let the driver go, he missed the fact that the refuel hose hadn't been disconnected. And the, the burning was just the fuel burning out as, uh, as, as it left the hose and the, the, the subsequent car went over. They entered the pits first, they ended the race 13th because of a number of stressors, performance shaping factors that led to this. But good divers doing their best. Often we, we see or hear about things going wrong. And in hindsight, we can look at this and go, God, that's stupid. So this guy, Will Smith, six years ago, six and a half years ago, went cave diving, went to explore a dry cave section, um, but hadn't taken a, an atmosphere detector with him. And he passed out because of, of hypoxia. And his friends couldn't recover him because they didn't have the right equipment to do so. So they had to go out and then somebody else came in and recovered the body. Um, that equipment was available, but the thought process wasn't there. Um, a number of years, uh, again, sort of six years ago, this was a double, uh, anybody dies rebreathers. This was a double cell failure. At that time, rebreather cells weren't very accessible because a company had pulled out of the market um, and there were pressures involved that basically led this instructor to diving his rebreather unit when he shouldn't have done. Again, easy to say in hindsight. Uh, and unfortunately, he had a toxicity event and his two students rescued him. And then we look at diving into the unknown. There's a recovery in um, uh, northern Norway. Uh, and I've forgotten the name of it. It will come to me later. Two divers died at depths of about 110 meters. Um, they, they got jammed, one of them got jammed, another panicked, um, and then they were recovered by their friends. And it's easy in hindsight to see that they maybe shouldn't have done what they did and they were operating in a very extreme environment. Everybody's trying to do the best they can. So what I'm trying to do with, I'm just gonna hide this little thing, I can't, um, with, with the work that I do is not just look at the adverse events, the accidents, the incidents that occur, but actually look at how do we uh, operate as, as high performance teams, individuals. Um, and unfortunately, we have a, a number of biases that, that work against us here. And often this is outcome bias. We have a good outcome, great, we must have been safe. Um, and if things are going wrong, uh, or we look back and we see those things that have gone wrong and they're obvious. But if they were that obvious to see, then people would have spotted them and they wouldn't have ended up in the accidents or the, the incidents they did. So I'm gonna look at a little bit about human error. Um, this is a quote that comes out of, well, comes way back from aviation where they were talking about 70, 80% of accidents down to human error. And I intentionally put inverted commas around there because human error is not a particularly useful term. It's great for as a bucket that you can throw things into like pilot error. Um, surgical error, diver error, but it doesn't help us. Because actually, if we end up with human error as, as a cause, then actually it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a symptom of what's going on. It's, it's a, if we end up in a report that says diver error or human error, that report was a waste of time because it didn't dig deep enough. Because actually, if you look at what goes on in the real world, and there's lots of research, not just from civil aviation, but other areas as well, you're talking about three to six errors per hour being made by pilots on the flight deck. Now, those who don't like flying, I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. But what is important is they recognize that those errors are going to happen and they've developed processes, procedures, tools to trap the errors before they become catastrophic. So it's not just about prevention. It's also about recovery and resilience. If we're going to look and improve our diving safety, we have to understand why it made sense for those to do what they did. Something called local rationality. So to me, doing something in the moment, it makes total sense. It is rational. But in hindsight, other people would look on and go, what on earth were you doing? That was obvious. 
And this is this is not new. This goes back, you know, 1947 research done by psychologists looking at the the, the errors that were being made by pilots while flying. Um, and the picture here is of a, a dashboard of a landing, sorry, of a, of a combing for a, a bomber, B-17 bomber that was in operating World War II. And the two knobs are circled purposely because one is the gear up down lever, which is the left hand one. And the one on the right hand side are the wing flaps. Now, the one on the right hand side has got some little guards on it and it didn't used to have that. Um, when it was initially made, pilots would taxi in and instead of raising the, la the, the flaps, they'd raise the landing gear and the gear would collapse and the aircraft would be on the ground. Um, and and the, the immediate response was more training. Stop being stupid. More training, more training, more training. It's like, hang on a minute. There's a limit to how much we can do this. And it wasn't until uh, a guy called Chipanis as a psychologist watched what was going on. He did a, a flight and he went, this is because those levers, those switches are almost identical to touch and they're spatially close to each other. So how's about you put a wheel on the landing gear one and just basically make a, a little stick uh, that sticks out for the flap and you move them spatially in the cockpit and they never had a similar event again because what they were doing is they were designing the system to take human fallibility into account. Now, if we look at what happens in diving and the research that's out there, um, this bit in the middle, the root cause is most commonly diver error. Well, that doesn't help us. Um, in terms of work that was done by Petar de Noble from, from Dan, and, and I know Petar and I've spoken to him about this. He said, in most cases, the inquiry ends with establishing the proximal cause of death. Proximal cause of death is, in effect, in the last 30 to 60 minutes or so in time and space. But actually, adverse events happen way back in time. And I'll show a, a number of examples of that. And, and I read a piece today uh, from a lawyer who was talking about, you know, the goal of an investigation is to find out why people didn't do what they were supposed to do or whether or not there was a medical issue or whether or not there was an equipment issue. Uh, I'm very much focused on the, the time and space of the event as opposed to the bigger system that's there. And th this lawyer made reference to this work that was presented at the Dan Re Recreational Fatalities Workshop in 2011 by a number of staff that or researchers that basically said, look, we'll look at, I think it was 1,047 fatalities. And they identified of those that they could, 47% of them ran out of air. That was the trigger point. And you sit there and go, that's great, but that doesn't help us improve diving safety because everybody knows that we shouldn't run out of gas. So, you know, when, when you go, and go to say to somebody on the dive, remember, don't run out of gas. Well, that's a bit obvious. So identifying that as a trigger, okay, fine. That's the first identified cause in the chain. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens prior to that that leads to people running out of gas. And those are the areas that we need to look to. And a lot of those are human factors in mind. So I'm, I'm going to give you, a, and, and I can't see the, um, the, the chat window. So um, I'll be interested to see what, uh, what the responses are. I'm going to show you a clip of a, a World War II map. And, and the reason why I'm doing this is to, to show you what your memory is like um, and, and how easily it can be led to a certain decision. So I'm going to give you a, an extract from a World War II map. The, the, the dark areas are water and the white areas are land. And I want you to try and identify where you think this piece of map is from. Now, you've probably got some questions, but I'm not going to answer them because I can't see them anyway. But I want you to tell me where you think this bit of map is from. So the, the water is dark and the land is white. And this is really hard to do in a, uh, a remote classroom where I can't see anybody. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so can yes, you uh, I've got some uh, folks here, um, Algeria. Okay. Keep on reading out. All right. I'm waiting for more to um, to respond. So if anybody's out there, you got some, uh, take up the challenge, uh, let us know. What do you uh, think this morning? I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, Scotland. Okay, it's not Scotland. <laughs> it's not Algeria. <laughs> have you got any others coming in the window? No, not not unfortunately not. Uh, might oh, okay. no, that's oh, hang on, hang on. Uh, not a map. Face of a cow says. Ah, <laughs> nobody's seen it before. So okay, no, Northern UK uh, from Greg Dressel. Uh, Jeremy says England. So those are the ones I have for the moment. Okay, so the person who said a cow is correct, and unfortunately, with with the um, uh, with the keynote presentation, you can't see my my cursor. Um, okay. But it is a cow looking out of the screen. So in the bottom right, as you look at it, there's a little bush. Um, the head itself is the main sort of third to the, uh, to the uh, center here. It's a real shame, actually. I can't. Uh, I can't draw. There we go. That that's something that yeah. I learned. This one doesn't work if you can't uh, if you can't show uh, the presentation. Yeah. So I'll move yeah. on. So actually, perspective is what we're talking about. So <laughs> in, in that situation. I set you up to say the land is white, the sea is dark. And people go, mm. but but you told us a lie. You go, well, to a certain extent I did in this case. But in the real world, I might have got some information wrong and you go away with the thought process that that's the correct idea. And what non-technical skills are about is trying to create a shared mental model within your team. A mental model is an approximation of reality what the wreck's going to look like, what the reef's going to look like, how long we're going to be, what's the current, where are things going to be, so that we all operate together as a team. Afterwards, we can see where that was completely mismatched. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is change people's view or perspective of what's going on. And, you know, here is a very simple one. Hey, great, somebody's come to rescue me. Hey, great, I've got some land to land on. And that's not, you know, both of those views are correct as are these. And this is one of the skills of when you start looking at the world through the lens of human factors, you start to realize that there are multiple perspectives that are going on here. And we have to recognize that Mornay's view of the world is different to mine, which is different to Michael's, uh, and the people are on the call. All of our views are correct because we view the world through our own lens of experience. And the goal of human factors is, and non-technical skills is to align those as close as we can through the skills that are out there. The human factors, I sort of touched on right at the start, it, it's a big topic. And, and I focus on a, a specific area, but it is massive. We, we often think about it as how well does my office chair fit uh, or the mouse that I'm using or door handles, all sorts of things. Those are the physical ergonomics that are out there. But actually, there's a little bit more than that. There's individual behaviors. How do we think about the system? How do we interact with it? How do we make decisions? Um, what about when we're operating as a team? There are bits about leadership and communication and how we encourage or motivate to develop other people. And then we go the next level up to an organization and we say, well, OK, how does the organization influence how we do stuff? How does a training agency reward certain behaviors which then reinforce or drive those behaviors? Say the number of certifications versus the quality that's associated with those. And then we go to the next level of saying, okay, so what's the, the legal or regulatory framework within that organization, within that that is operating? And as diving is a global sport, you know, we've got American rules, we've got European, we've got UK, we've got Germany, we've got South African, we've got foreign. All of those things have got different rules about how we do stuff. And then we go one step further where we're looking at societal and cultural pressures and, and how do we behave as a society that influences our individual activity right at the start. And I saw a piece the other day said, look, you know, it is your choice for the decisions you make you are ultimately responsible for your choices. And I will say that actually that's not true. There are many things that we can do as a, as a society, a culture, as an organization, as a team to influence how people behave because we are social creatures and we like to conform. Now, an easy way of describing this is, is talking about Homer Simpson being in a nuclear power station where he has a display system controls that are a complete mess to try and use. Um, he's, uh, he needs his donuts and his coffee to stay awake. Um, he's a bit of a scatterbrain anyway, 
And he's got Mr. Burns who's saying, keep the power on, keep the power on, um, because we can't, you know, I'm going to lose money if, uh, if I don't give the power to Springfield. And then just before his, his donut and coffee time, it's, it's a couple of hours after lunch, so he's, he's got a bit of a slump. He's got the old sort of post-lunch heading, heads nodding away. And the alarms go off on the screen, and he's got no idea what's going on because the training he had wasn't very robust. The interface is really poor. He's not paying attention because he's tired. He needs some sugar. And in his ear, he's got this Mr. Burns going, keep it going, keep it going. And through trial and error, he manages to solve the problem. And he sits there and goes, you know what? Maybe I should tell somebody about this. But no, nah, I'm not going to tell anybody because the last time I told somebody where I got something wrong, I got into trouble. So I'm not going to talk about it. We don't have a, a reporting system that works anyway. And there are so many parallels in diving to Homer operating in the nuclear power station. What needs to happen is what's ha what did happen in the nuclear industry following Three Mile Island and Chernobyl was actually they started to bring human factors and human performance into the setup to realize we, we, we're all gonna make mistakes. So how do we reduce the likelihood of those mistakes happening? And then how do we make sure that when things do go wrong, we fail safely? But ultimately it's not about changing the human. Um, this, uh, there are two little post-it notes. One says door release and the other one says horrible noise. And you sit there and go, why would you put the exit and the emergency exit buttons right next to each other. And my view is there's a single cable running up to the loft and then I don't have to run another cable up the wall. So it's great. But the person who designed that, who installed it, is not the user of the system. And they're not the ones that inherit the problems. Same thing about pilots. Um, this was another seminal event, 1983. Uh, Kegworth, 47 people killed, 74 injured where the pilot shut down the wrong engine. You sit there going, these are professionals. Why would they do that? And yet this was Taiwan would be four years ago now, where again, the pilot shut down the wrong engine. And both cases, these were not incompetent pilots. They were trained, they were professional, but what had happened is the system had let them down and they were made flawed decisions in the pressure of the moment. Uh, and unfortunately the one in Taiwan, I think all but three people died. Uh, when it crashed into the river. But you look about this in, in diving, these are two O-rings. Anybody who dives an AP Inspiration rebreather will recognize these. Um, these are the, the, the bits that seal the CO2 scrubber uh, and stop CO2 breakthrough. I know a number of people who've left these out. And the simple answer is follow the checklist. But in reality, there are different ways of doing it. And one of the key parts about engineering safely or properly is to engineer out the problem, which is what uh, Hollis did, where it, it was um, uh, VR technologies when they made the Explorer to start with and then sold it to Hollis, was about not allowing you to put uh, or to close the unit without the scrubber material being put in place. And the, the other image with the red panel is from a, a Poseidon Mark VI, where a diver died through CO2 hypercapnia because the scrubber hadn't been put in. So what um, Kevin Gurr did at uh, VR was actually put an interlock in that you couldn't shut the unit, couldn't close it down unless the scrubber canister was in place. So it's about recognizing that we carry and have a lot of risks or uncertainties. And, and I get into a bit of um, grief. People give me hassle for saying that diving is a high risk activity. Um, it, it's a, a low probability, high consequence event. And to a certain extent, the probabilities are almost irrelevant. The consequences are that when you run out of gas, you have a, uh, depending on what's going on, a strong likelihood of ending up dead. Now that isn't in any of the marketing materials. And I get it, it's not good for marketing. Somebody comes into your dive shop and you say, well, they say to you, I wanna learn how to dive. And you turn around and say, well, Bit of a dangerous sport, really. Um, if, you, if you get it wrong, you could end up dying. Oh, okay, I'll go and do something else. Um, because it requires a lot of time and skill and effort to get to the point where if you do run out of gas, it's not a major problem because your buddy is there or you've got an alternative source or whatever it is, you've planned around this. Because one of the things that we often forget about is that outcomes are not just about the technical skills, which is the image at the top. 
And, and this framework was taken from uh, a research paper that I wrote for the Journal of Thoracic Disease, and it was about thoracic surgeons. And they were assessed on you know, their technical skills. That's what makes a good surgeon. And myself and the two other co-authors were talking about, well, actually, it's a lot more than that. It takes into account the environment. That's the social environment, the physical environment, the cultural environment, how well the task is designed and set up and how well the equipment is for use. If it's difficult to use and it's prone to error, don't be surprised that the surgical teams make an error. And then there's randomness and luck. And in the context of the paper, CF is compared to luck. In the context of this paper that we wrote, it was things like antibiotics. Do you know you're allergic to antibiotics? Well, you do the first time it happens. And, and that's the sort of bad luck side. And then we talk about non-technical skills, which is what the paper was about. Um, now, in the diving context, nearly all the training courses that are out there are focused on technical skills. And that's about buoyancy, propulsion, trim. Uh, it might be line laying. It might be using a DPV or a rebreather. But that's where the focus is. None of the other elements are really touched on and in terms of helping you have a successful outcome. In terms of randomness and luck, well, that could be human physiology and decompression sickness, um, or it could be that you've got a PFO, as I found out in 2009. I had an eight millimeter by 12 millimeter PFO that was fixed in the following February. Um, I didn't know I had it. I'd already had about 15 uh, hypoxic trimix dives up to that stage in the sort of 60, 70 meter range. Hadn't got any decompression illness issues. And then we talk about the non-technical skills at the bottom. Now, you might note that there's a, a, a cross, a multiplication symbol between the different layers, and that is intentional because these are not additive. They are uh, multiplicatory in nature. Um, and the problem is we don't know how important each one of those layers is. We don't know how important the, the factors within there. And as an example, and we don't know what the threshold of success is either. So it could be that my technical skills are spot on out of out of a you know out of one it's 0.9 so between zero and one it's 0.9 context yeah lots of stuff's on my side um, it's a good day clear visibility good temperatures i'm all happy with what i'm doing that's a 0.92 randomness well that's on my side it's one and i've got good awareness about what's going on i'm making sound decisions communicating clearly and i'm not particularly stressed or tired so I've got a score of maybe 0.8. I don't know what the pass score is. Now, if my technical skills are still 0.9, my context is still 0.9, randomness is on my side, it's 0.1, sorry, it's one. And my non-technical skills, what happens here is I have some miscommunication, which means that my situation awareness about what's going on around me and what's gonna happen next is incomplete, which means that I make a fantastic decision on bad information. So actually this is now a 0.2. So I've got 0.9 times 0.9 is 0.8 times 0.2 gives me 0.16. The threshold might be 0.5, I don't know. The difficulty is we don't know where those are. So what we should be doing is, is looking to improve on all of these levels. And as touched on right at the start of this, there are very few training materials that cover these non-technical skills and human factors. Now, this is a quote from a colleague of mine in the States. We look at prevention as a way of well, trying to stop bad stuff happening. And his point is safety is not the absence of accidents, but rather the presence of barriers and defenses and the capacity of the system to fail safely. The absence of accidents does not mean that you've got a safe system. It could mean that you're just being really lucky and I often ask people when they come up and go, hey, look at that, that was great. And it looks a bit mm, squeaky, you know, and I say, so were you lucky or were you good? And the truly reflective people will look at it and go, yeah, we were lucky. If we think we're good, if they say they're good, I go, okay, so why? Tell me what you did that maximized your success and minimized your failure. We don't manage risk in diving, we manage uncertainty. And the subtle difference is risk is managed through numbers and it's a lot of things about comparing um, one risk against another. Uncertainties are managed through biases, cognitive biases, 
mental shortcuts that make us or lead us to think that we're doing the right thing. And we're, we are judged based on outcomes. And the more severe, the more harsh that outcome, so a fatality or somebody being seriously injured will be judged more harshly than almost the same events, but they don't have that same outcome. So what we need to do is start taking a, a systems approach. And some of you may have seen this before as a Swiss cheese model. And the idea is that you put these barriers and defenses in place to try and stop adverse events occurring. But we're all human. We make those mistakes. So those barriers have got holes in them. And when those holes line up as they do here, then we end up with an accident. And the difficulty is that we don't know what's happened further back up in time. And it might be something the organization's made a mistake and it hasn't been trapped. Or if it has, it's like, oh, it's okay. Somebody else will pick that up. And so when I'm in time here, to me, left of time, I'm hoping that nobody's made mistakes. And in terms of right of time to the future, I hope nobody makes mistakes because, or, or if, if they, you know, they pick up my mistakes. So we have to look at these things in a much bigger piece. And I'm going to quickly go through these uh, and I'll make the slides available uh, for people. Um, this is based on work by Chappelle and Weidman in the um, US Marine Corps. And they came together with this sort of framework. It's called the Human Factors Analysis and Classification System talking about how the organization influences what goes on. So there are a number of factors that sit up at this level. And in the context of diving, this is, you know, there's lots of things that are going on, but to me, blame is the enemy of safety. This Nancy Leeson's a, a world leading uh, engineer on systems engineering. What the organization does influences the stuff that happens below. Then we talk about the unsafe supervision. And one of the challenges in diving is that We've got two sorts of diving. We've got at work diving, where you are being uh, an instructor or a dive center. Um, it might be even in a club environment that you're in a formal structure that allows things to be managed. And then we have fun diving. Um, this, this, uh, I know we spend a little bit more time on, on this slide, but if you want to know what the image is, B-52 crash and Google Bud Holland um, as a story of how an organization and the supervisory chain failed and it led to a B-52 being cra uh, to crashing in a display uh, when they shouldn't have been doing what they were doing. So there are things that happen at the supervisory level that can be addressed. And then we talk about the individuals themselves. Um, how do they set themselves up for success? Being properly rested, being properly trained, skilled, having the right frame of mind. And I know that uh, Laura Walton, Dr. Laura Walton, has it runs a site called Fit to Dive and Scuba Psych, where she's looking at a lot of the, the mental aspect of what's going on here. And if you're at all interested, go and look up at her, her site uh, or Google Laura Walton and Fit to Dive. She's got fantastic resources that are out there. And then what we're talking about, substandard practices of operators, crew resource management or non-technical skills, trying to create a shared mental model within the team. Now, at the individual level, we've got all sorts of issues because we are fallible. And when we make mistakes, a lot of it's based on the context and the environment we're operating in. If I'm really well trained and I know what I'm doing, lots of motor skills, lots of practice, the likelihood of me making an error is about one in 10,000. If I'm following rules to get stuff done and the sequences and there's the, the you know checklist and everything else like that, the rate is about one in 100. But if I'm operating in knowledge-based space, which basically means I haven't encountered this before, I'm going to make a best guess about what's going on. It's called satisficing. It's good enough. The error rate goes one in two to one in 10. And this is why experience becomes really important because you can move things from you know, practicing and you know what you need to do. So you're in rules-based and then moving into skills-based. Because if you're in a knowledge-based environment, don't be surprised that people make mistakes. And just read this on the slide now. And I'm sure you're scanning up and down going, oh, what? We pattern match in real time to our own previous experiences. 
And this sort of thing is why it's easy to make the wrong, you know, make a wrong decision given certain information. Now, uh, another part of this is the risks or the, the violations that uh, that we make and we, with the rules we break. Um, I forgot his name. Patrick Hudson did some work in the oil and gas industry. You know, a high reliability, high safety conscious industry, and they said actually more than two thirds of people, more than three quarters of people have either or wouldn't have an issue breaking the rules. And a lot of that is about context. And then there were only a few that would never violate the rules. Um, in the diving environment, one of the difficulties we have is there's lots of gray areas that are not there. Some other research that was looked at anesthetists and how they operated and why they broke rules. Um, and often it was about the, the rule, who wrote it, the quality of it, the validity of it. The, the anaesthetist, what was their culture? What was their risk taking? What other pressures were on at the time? And then stuff that I'd looked at <clears throat> where I'd ask people, have you ever ended a dive with, with no, you know, have you ever run out of gas on a dive? That uh, 6% of those respondents had more than a quarter had ended the dive with 50 bar or 500 PSI. And context, again, becomes quite important. But the fact that 6% of those divers have run out of the gas is, is just odd to me. But understanding that they ended up as a successful outcome because they survived and they could fill in the, the form. So we have to look at the context and why people are breaking the rules. And often this is about pressures that are there. And that might be time. It might be benefits. So if I break the rules, I can get something done. Or I don't want to fail. I don't want to look stupid. So as an easy example, um, speeding. In the UK, speed limit is 70 miles an hour. That's the legal space, the framework that's there. This is, I'm going to say, the illegal normal space. I would say most people on the motorway are traveling between 75 and 80 miles an hour in the sort of middle and outside lanes. And then you end up with the illegal, illegal space where people are just <laughs> off they go down. And then we end up with accidents out there. Now, the thing is that you don't necessarily always have an accident when you speed. And because you can have an accident if you're within the speed limit as well. But what you're doing is you're eroding the safety margins. And the same thing applies, you know, draw a parallel with diving. You can use a checklist prior to every dive. That's what you're supposed to do. Well, I only use a checklist when I'm diving with somebody new because I want to make sure that they're doing their stuff properly. I'm okay, but I want to make sure they're okay. Uh, but if I'm an instructor, the only time I use a checklist is when I'm being checked or if, if I'm on a course or something like that. And again, just because you don't use a checklist, it doesn't mean you will have an accident. But in hindsight, you can turn around and go, ah, they should have used a checklist and the accident wouldn't have happened. Now, this normalization of deviance that's there is because we're very poor at looking at uh, absolute distances, deltas that are there. So I have a rule. Uh, the first line is the rules. And over a period of time, I'll erode those and I'll set a new baseline and I'll operate to this. And you say, well, that's, yeah, it's okay. Things didn't go wrong. I'll be fine. And, and we set this as, as the new standard. And over a period of time, we drift again, and we drift again, and we drift again. And then we have an accident. And you sit there going, hang on a minute. How could I have an accident? You know, or rather the observers look on and go, you are so far away from the rules. How could you have not seen that? They go, well, no, because what I was doing was looking at this little delta. And that's the problem as humans. We look at little deltas. We have comparators. We're pattern matching. And as long as we don't have a bad outcome, then everything must be OK. Because what we do is we stitch. I call it stitching this line. This is a safe standards line. And I have I go from one to two and I have a little bit of a safe, scary moment. <gasps> Ooh, that was lucky. And I go back into where my standards were and I continually stitch this line. And it might be my friends or my buddies or my team members or my uh, dive center manager picks it up and goes, hang on a minute go back to where you are because we have some standards. But if I don't have something go wrong or if I don't have somebody bring me and hold me accountable, then I drift and I end up setting up this as my new baseline. 
I don't know where the accident point is. That's what that unacceptable performance boundary is. It could be just one little thing out of the multiple variables that are out there that steps me over the line. Again, this goes back to why we should be having clear, I'm going to say clearly, as clear as we can define standards within the team and we can hold each other accountable to those. Because if we have standards, then it's much easier to come back to the line. But just because you've got high skills, it doesn't mean that actually you're very good at what we're trying to do. And this is where the bits that are missing in terms of non-technical skills. Aviation recognized it, you know, from the 1970s, where controlled flight into terrain was this term. They basically went, why are pilots still in control of the aircraft and they're flying into the ground? And they ran through a number of workshops and training programs and everything that was going on, and they reduced the number of fatal accidents. And in fact, one of the reasons it happened is because the insurance companies or the International uh, Air Transport Association said you can't be a member unless you've got a crew resource management program in place. There are other areas I've been involved in, um, in the oil and gas sector for well operations crew resource management. So in 2014, I ended up being involved in a program where we went and delivered two days of training in a classroom and then seven days of coaching on the oil rigs themselves. The surface side of, um, the, uh, of the oil and gas sector gets this. It's still hard to bring it in. The diving, the underwater subsurface side hasn't happened. And that's to a certain extent why I put under pressure together, realizing that I could teach classes and I'm doing that, but I'm not getting the reach. Um, and the way that the diving system as a whole is managed at the agency level, risk is managed by transferring to the lowest level possible to get away from the organizations. And that's done through liabilities and waivers. And it's moving it down to the dive centers and the instructors and the divers themselves. So I, I get why this doesn't make sense for agencies to do it. Um, from a liability point of view, but from a performance point of view, it would make sense. Those skills that are in here are interdependent. So you could develop leadership, but if you don't understand communications, you don't understand teamwork, you don't understand situation awareness and decision making and performance shaping factors, you're not going to be a very good leader. And so, you know, you might develop situation awareness. Great. I know what's going on. But unless I communicate that to my team and I understand how to communicate and what will impact my situation awareness, then we're not going to have successful outcomes either. So what I do to help you, um, other than doing webinars like this, which I love talking, um, I wrote under pressure. The first ever Human Factors in Diving conference will happen 24th and 25th of September. There are 30 speakers going to be present. Um, from all aspects of diving, from recreational, technical, cave, scientific, military, uh, public safety diving, and commercial diving. Plus, we've got people from outside of the diving domain, like oil and gas specialists, healthcare, talking about how did they bring human factors into their environments. Um, my main website, thehumandiver.com, uh, where all the training programs are, and the link for if only is humandiver.com forward slash if only. Um, that is 34 minutes long. If you're a dive center manager or an instructor, especially a rebreather instructor, go and watch it, download the workbook, and you can run workshops in your own environment, uh, and the instructions are in that workbook. It's free, crack on. And that takes me to questions. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh... Well, then, let me just put my camera on. Great stuff. Amazing talk. Um, while we wait for the questions to come in, uh, I mean, uh, great take home messages with all the checklists. I mean, it, it really just um, makes things so much easier and, and takes the pressure off a little bit. You know, you got something and, and takes complex things and makes it easier to digest and get ready and get on with what you want to do. Um, it reminds me also of my time when I was running dive centers in Mozambique, having those things in place, 
things working properly once that system was in uh, and working. Um, yeah. I could relate to what you were saying with some of the commercial side of things, especially say, I think you were struggling with the commercial guys or the diving guys to, to implement certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I implemented, there was a lot of kickback because obviously there's paperwork, you've got to do this and, and, and just follow ups and so forth. But once it uh, you know got into the flow of things, yeah, things changed and it changed drastically, which was quite nice. So I see um, we got some folks uh, just uh, popped in a couple so of things. Any questions? Questions. any questions from today? And, yeah. and actually, you know, from, um, yeah, so Louise, that, that whole normalization of deviance piece about driving. And, and the difficulty is, you know, the probability of having an accident is, is I don't know, one in, I don't know, 20,000 miles driven. But if it happens to you there and then, the probability is one. It's happened. And, and the difficulty yeah. is, as humans, we're, we're pretty rubbish at judging risk because we've got so many biases that rely on our previous experiences. If we haven't had a bad outcome, then everything must be okay. And I, I'm a pessimistic person from that, or, you know, because I, I see lots of things, and I'm sure you're the same, one, eh, that because you see these events coming in, you go, oh, mm. there's, there's loads of these things happening. And yeah, you realize yeah. that actually there's millions of divers out there. And, mm. you know, the probability of, of a diving fatality, the numbers that I've seen, and, and I've got some queries about the veracity of those, but, you know, one in 200,000 dives ends up as a fatality. Yeah. Well, the problem is that our brains sit there and go, I'm never going to do 200,000 dives. Therefore, yeah. I am not going to die. It, it's just, you know, and people go, well, that's really stupid to think that way. No, that's how yeah. we think about odd numbers like this. We're, we're poor at managing it. We don't know. So, yeah. and, and afterwards, it's really easy to spot these things. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, on the day, you never know, just say from a physical side, mental side, things might go, go wrong. You might have done all your checks, but then I guess that's when the training, the knowledge and all those things you spoke of come into play to ensure it. So we, we've got uh, another question here from Al. Uh, yep. We're developing a checklist. How do you prevent making your checklist right. too detailed? Great question. I love this one. Yeah. Great. So what you can <laughs> so Morne, while I answer this, you can type in um, the www thehumandiver.com forward slash checklists. Okay. And I did a webinar, a 90 minute webinar two weeks ago, or uh, sorry, a month ago, all about this. But to answer your question, Al, it, it's working out what the critical, literally killer items are and work out what the flow is. So how do you prevent your checklist being too detailed and as a result of discarded or ignored? There, There is a checklist is part of a social technical system. By that, I mean, you have to have some training. It needs to sit in the, the, um, the social environment to be acceptable to use. The steps within it, you're probably talking about five to eight steps, and each one of those steps should have three, four, five words in it, and they are mental prompts for the technical training that you've had. The difficulty is when um, checklists are often written, they're like big pages loads, and there's loads of text on it and people just pick it up and go, I'll do that from memory because I know what I need to do and they forget the purpose of it. So yeah, the, 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 there's a whole webinar on, on checklists, which is, is free to, um, yep, that's cool, brilliant. Uh, yeah, I'll put it in there. So that one, which, uh, why human facts are not part of instructor training diving, is it not important? Um, I'm somewhat biased and I think the answer is yes. Um, why is it not? because it's really difficult to show the value of it. Because, uh, and I don't know whether or not you were right in the start, uh, Martin, when I was talking, human factors is, is general in nature and specific in application. But the good thing is once you've seen it, once you've got an idea of how it works and how it's, how it's applied, then it's really difficult not to see it. Uh, and I think one of my uh, instructor trainees is on here, and, and we, we've had a bit of sort of um, exchange back and forth. Like, I can't stop seeing the world differently now. Um, and the, the difficulty is there are a number of those in the senior decision making places of the training agencies who think they are covering it in their materials and they're not. I get 
course directors, instructor trainers, instructors coming into my classes going, we need this in our materials. The difficulty is making a financial decision based on putting those materials in. Because now, even if you put them into the materials, you now have to go and upskill all of the instructor trainers, all the instructors, and then get that flow down. So there is a huge, and it's something that I've learned over the last 10 years that I've been doing this, is understand things from a systems perspective. Um, and there has to be a huge shift. In aviation, it was about sticking aircraft in the ground and, and low public confidence in aircraft being reliable. In healthcare, it's the number of dead people, unfortunately, due to medical error, medical error, um, where we're looking at changing things. Oil and gas is the same thing. There is, I doubt, uh, I'm being quite brutal, I doubt there will be enough people killed to make a difference in diving that says we have to put this in place. Where it will come will be from some external pressure that says put this in place. Or it could come from grassroots where I have people come on training or people come on the training with myself and the instructors and they start creating a movement inside their own organization that says this has value, let's put it in place. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you, you first need to have that experience before you understand uh, the need, the necessity, and the value of it. Um, yeah. Here's another uh, question, I guess, uh, during dives with missions, how yeah. do we maintain situational awareness? So it, it's a really valid point. And the difficulty with situational awareness is it's based around your own technical competencies as well. So you've got to have spare capacity. You've got to be able to do whatever you're doing with some spare brain power so then you can see what else is going on around you. So there is a, a level of competency that you're then comfortable and then you've got some spare brain load or brain capacity that you can look elsewhere. Then what you do with that is you use effective briefs to tell you what you're expecting to see and what might happen and what the cues and clues that you should be looking for for when it's going horribly wrong. And then you have debriefs afterwards, structured debriefs that say, okay, what did we learn on that dive? What do we see? What do we feel? What do we hear? And as a team, you share those experiences. And this is some work that uh, a psychologist, Gary Klein, did looking at something called naturalistic decision making and how firefighters in the moment would be able to make decisions without realizing it. And, and he would ask these guys, how do you make that decision? You go, I don't know. It just did. And he said, well, what he did was he observed them and they would come back from a, sh from a job. They put the engine in the shed, they clean it up, clean the gear up, ready for the next shout. And then they go upstairs, they grab a brew and they talk through as a team what they saw, heard, felt, smelt, what it meant to them, what the significance was. And then as a team, they increased their shared mental model about what might happen the next time. And each time they build that up. So from PSD side, You've got a structured environment. What you need then is the, the leadership that says we are going to run man, you know, structured briefs and we are going to run structured debriefs, and that's how we're going to get better. Um, it, it's, there is no magic bullet for increasing situation awareness other than being competent so you have f spare mental capacity to deal with it. Yeah. All right. Okay, so Dominique... Um I think just uh, compliment and, and highlighting uh, what you've done from the aviation side into to diving. So that's great. Uh, let yeah. me just see so Mark's one. On to Domin Dominic's one there. Yeah, we haven't had our Haddon Cave, unfortunately, um, okay. which was, for those who don't know, it was a, uh, a Nimrod exploded over Afghanistan. Uh, and the investigation was completely damning about how the minist UK Ministry of Defence managed aviation safety. And it was very much a tick box culture, sign it, hand it over, hand it over, hand it over. And there was just a huge accrual of, of hazards without people realizing it. And there was a, a, a hot air leak over a fuel pipe, which then um, caused an explosion with total loss of life. So, yeah. Uh, wow. Antonius, uh, sorry, uh, Martin, I can just see I'm missing it in my course and instructor and probably why I did not feel I was missing that side of diving. Uh, Martin, I think you might be, are you Netherlands based? 
Uh, if so, um, there's a guy on here called Bart Den Alden, who's uh, mm. my instructor in the Netherlands. So you two could hook up uh, if that's the case. Okay. Uh, yeah, got that one. And then Antonio, right. do you think there is a way of improving uh, human error? Well, um, okay. I think what you talk about is reducing human error. We are all fallible. We will all make mistakes. What we can do mm. is look at error-producing conditions. So on the, um, the, the the little framework that I had, I got a little a vertical point that said stress and fatigue. Well, they're the two main performance shaping factors that are there. What they do is they limit our attention, they shrink our ability. So going back to, uh, where's the PSD guy? Aaron's point about situation awareness. If we have a limited situation awareness, we can't make sound decisions because we're not collecting all of the information. Um, what we can do is we can reduce those error producing conditions. So time pressures, money pressures, uh, developing competencies in the skills, having debriefs that are there. We're never going to get to zero human error. We're never going to get to zero incidents. We're never going to get to zero fatalities. There is always a likelihood, albeit a small probability of something going wrong. So as a consequence, what we need to be doing is that quote from Todd Conklin, look to fail safely. So you have stuff on this side of, of an event, preventative training, um, equipment, servicing, all sorts of stuff, an event in the middle, and then on this side when it goes wrong. That could be Dan. It could be medical services. Uh, it could be training, rescue skills, teamwork. Um, but just bear in mind that some of your mitigations may not be as robust as you think they are. So you've got Dan Insurance. Awesome. You're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's not like they've got a teleport device that can get you from the boat to a chamber. So, yes, you've got this magic little bit of paper or card that says I've got some insurance and it's going to cover the financial side. Just bear in mind that they can't magic you from where you are to somewhere else. And, and I've been involved in a number of conversations where people have been, you know, 36 hour boat ride from shore. And it's like, but, you know, and, and they end up doing multiple dives with DCS and ended up with a spinal bend. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Martin got back. He said he's from Denmark. So I don't know uh, if you have. Yeah, or, right. or you can drop, drop me a line, Martin, and we can uh, we can sort something out. Yeah. So, Michael, I know we've got you on the line as well. Uh, any questions from your end or uh, suggestions for um, for the audience? Look, the the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway on this dog is, is what we really need to start looking at um, from a diving point of view. When it's from a recreational point, from a, a, a technical diving point of view, and for those of, of of us who dive CCRs and uh, you know our CCR instructors and so on, and you know the the the, the simplest thing, and I always come back to the checklist, and um, I, I've been a fan of a, a checklist always. With uh, and and Gareth just really highlights it and strengthens the point. On on rebreathers, we tend to use checklists to a point. And then um, we forget to use them, and we remember, and we try and do it from 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 memory. And there's a lot of things you need to go through. Uh, and really, I can take the same thing back to to open circuit as well. Switching on, making sure that your cylinders on. How many people jumping into the water with a cylinder that is off? If they were running a checklist, that cylinder would be switched on. Have they tested the regulators and so on? When it comes to rebreathers, well, we have another problem that's there. And and it's a simple thing as well is that you could be you could be assembling your breather, your buddy or your friend comes and interrupts you, and you kind of forget where you are because you don't have a checklist to go back on. And how many people then jump in the water and and uh, they haven't put the O-ring there, this and that. So so yes, you know, for, for me the biggest takeaway has always been um, risk mitigation and checklists. Cool. Okay. And the thing about checklist is the social environment. That, that they sit in. Having been my last liverboard that I was on, I was one of four rebreather divers. I was the only one using a written checklist. And the other three were giving me grief for it. And it's really hard from a social perspective to sit there and go, no, I am going to use my written checklist and I'm going to go through the steps and do it. 
And I know two of the four divers who got in, uh, each individually, at least one occasion, didn't have the cylinders on as they, they, they descended down the shot line. As they reached back and, and, and turned their cylinders on going down. And mm -hmm. they sit there and go, well, you know, mentally, they didn't die. Therefore, what they did was must have been okay. And it reinforces that, oh, it's okay, because I'll trap it. But if you go and watch If Only, that wasn't the first time that Brian had had that same issue with his rebreather. Unfortunately, on this occasion, he was overworked um, and distracted doing something else and went hypoxic and drowned. Um, and people just go, oh, that's obvious that was going to happen. No, it's not. It, it is in hindsight because you can see it. But in real time, and so to your point then, uh, Michael, is if you're diving in a team, and, and I'm a strong proponent of team diving, is you can hold each other to account. Where if you create the environment, you go, hey, Michael, you haven't done your checks. And well, you go, there's another, yeah, there, there's another point there as well, and that comes down to even uh, mixed team diving, where you could have CCR divers, you could have uh, um, open circuit divers, and we could have diving to really great depths as well on, on that, like, all mixed. Mm -hmm. And so you might have one team member feeling he's holding the other, the, the rest of the team up, so he says, comes down to peer pressure. Now, if he had his, his checklist and he was going steadily through his checklist, well, other people must either wait or he could get there earlier and, and, and start going through his gear beforehand. Um, and if at the end of the day he's not ready to dive, well, he's not ready to dive. And th this is the sort of thing we need to really start looking at. Totally. It's just too easy to just jump in the water and think, oh, well, nothing went wrong before. You know, it's, it'll all be good. And, and it's not really captured in any of the incident reports that are raised either. You know, it, it's the, the basically he jumped off the back of the boat without doing his checks, stupid bloke. And you sit there and go, oh, exactly. okay. what was the context? And when I go and work with high risk industries, oil and gas, construction, engineering, their big takeaway is we need to move away from the event and look at the context. Telling people to, you know, to use a checklist or make sure the gas is turned on. That's great, but we know that. What we need to look at is why aren't people able to do that? And that goes back to that point where I said about Petar's piece about running out of gas. Everybody out there, don't run out of gas, okay? Duh, it's obvious. But why is it that we're not? And that's that's the sort of detail that's not being captured because it's not really being considered up until now because there hasn't been that sort of mindset shift that says, hang on a minute. People are not intentionally getting in the water with a with a view of going hypoxic for whatever reason or drowning. So, yeah, yeah I guess leadership starts from the top, you know, and changing the culture set. Uh, I've seen it around the world where we've done some visits, and um, yeah, some of the dive centres have got uh, all these checks in place, and yet yeah, things still go wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a mind shift, as you say. So. Yeah. Anyways, okay. Actually, uh, yes, that video would be suitable for beginner divers as well. Any any recommendations for new divers? Um, one of the, the and it's probably the hardest thing is don't be afraid to say no. In, in the technical diving world, and, and to a certain extent, it's coming into the recreational side. Is anybody can thumb a dive at any time for any reason with no questions asked. Now. If you're on holiday, there's, and, and talking to Michael's point, you know, you're rushing, everybody else is doing it, it's really hard to say no. But sit there and go, you know what? I, I'll miss this dive, and then I can be better prepared for the next one. Because it is, I can't remember what the phrase is, it's something along the lines of, it's much better to be on the boat wishing you were down below than being under the water wishing you were back up on the surface. Um, and, and that's hard especially as a new diver, because you will look up to the dive masters, the guides, the instructors, the more experienced divers, and you'll look at them and go, well, they know what they're doing, you know, and, and you know, as the role modeling piece, instructors who don't do buddy checks, hey, cool, if I get to be an instructor, I don't need to do a buddy check. Why? You know, but it's hard, I, I get that. And this is why trying to bring it into the training materials to expose these sorts of pressures that are there, rather than just saying, man up, deal with it, it'll be okay. When in fact, it, it's not as simple as that. Fantastic, all right. Excellent, thank you, Audric. So, um, yeah, there we go. 
Well, if there are any more questions, uh, you're more than welcome to ask the way. If not, uh, we'll give it a, another little bit um, before, uh, I guess, we can call it a night or an evening. Uh, from my side, it's been fantastic. Uh, uh, great uh, to catch up and look at all these different aspects that, um, yeah, I guess sometimes are or quite often overlooked rather than taking them into uh, consideration and then moving forward to, you know, I guess enjoy the sport far better. Mm. And, uh, you know, I like your um, – it's good to know that uh, – it's not just uh, the folks out there, but you also feel the social pressures, Gareth, uh, from time to time. Oh, totally, totally. It's <laughs> really hard. And, and so, you know, just even two weeks ago, I did my CCR uh, refresher or I did my GUE CCR class. Mm. And I got in and my left glove started to leak. It was in a quarry here. It's about 12 degrees. And I sit again, oh, man, I've got an hour and a bit's worth of diving. You know what? I'm just going to thumb it, get back up, took the dry gloves off, put wet gloves back on and got back in the water. And and there was that bit of, oh, I'm, I'm going to mess somebody else's dive up if I end it now. But I knew that I'd yeah. got an hour plus in the water and it would just, it would have been miserable and dangerous. So yeah, it, it's not easy. So is that the human factor then, I guess? I guess. It is. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. it is. And it's that bit that says, how do you prepare yourself? And it's this recognition that says, it's the wrong thing. I need to change that. And that requires yeah. mental courage to do so. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Well, I guess way. that's uh, it's, it's part of being uh, social creatures. You know, we, we're always going to put those pressures on ourselves, but oh, yeah. yeah, we'll manage them. So I can see loads of thank yous uh, and... Uh, gratitude and all that kind of jazz. So that's fantastic stuff. Um, from my side, thank you very much for everybody that attended. I think, uh, you know, the load shedding in South Africa hit us a bit hard. Uh, it's not everybody managed to, to join, but we had a good uh, 70, 80 odd people on the call from start until now. So that's been great. Uh, for the folks that have been supporting us uh, this evening and for many of the other webinars, thank you so much. And then from my side, Gary, thank you for making the time and your willingness to actually offer more of these going forward. So, um, yeah. If, uh, you in about a month's time then. Yeah, yeah. We'll have a look at that. Michael, for your time and contribution and also making the introductions and getting the ball rolling. That's fantastic. So um, any parting words, uh, uh, Gareth? No. Um, the, in fact, the only parting words I would say is knowledge is not enough. We must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. And it's what I write in the cover of the books when I post them out. You can gain yeah. knowledge, but you've got to do something with it. Uh, so what I would say is yeah. take this away and do something with it. All yeah. right. Well, thank you very much. Mark, anything from your side? Or is that just mm -hmm. a, a Cheerios? Okay. It's a cheerio. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, okay. Wherever you are in the world, have a good uh, day further and see you next time. Goodbye. Right. Ciao, ciao. Thank you.